Good evening aspirants. Welcome to Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 23rd January 2024. Displayed here are the list of topics we are going to see today. Now without wasting any time, let us get into the discussion. Look at this news article. It is about the construction of fourth desalination plant in Chennai. This new plant will have capacity to treat 400 minimal liquid discharge. If this construction get completed, the desalination plant in chennai becomes the largest desalination plant in southeast asia so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context we shall see about desalination process for our prelims exam see desalination is a process of removing salts from water to produce water that meets the quality requirement of human uses first let us see some basic information about desalination it is a process of producing drinking water from salt water Desalination plants or facilities that remove salt from sea water or brackish water. This process has been practiced for centuries but it has become economically feasible in recent decades. Know that there are two main types of desalination process. They are thermal desalination and membrane desalination. Thermal desalination plants use the heat to evaporate sea water so that they leave behind the salt. In membrane desalination plants, they use semi-permeable membranes to filter the salt from sea water. As we know, the most commonly used technology for desalination plant is reverse osmosis. Now we shall see this reverse osmosis process in detail. In simple terms, you can say reverse osmosis is a technology that is used to remove majority of contaminants from water. This is done by pushing the water under pressure through a semi-permeable membrane. Now how does reverse osmosis work? Look at the diagram here. It shows how this process works. Sea water or brackish water is pumped into high pressure chamber. See there is a semi permeable membrane placed in the chamber. The high pressure is applied on the sea water and it forces water molecules to pass through the membrane thereby the salt molecules are left behind. So the filtered water is collected as fresh water. There are different types of reverse osmosis membranes that are used in desalination plant. The most common type of RO membrane is cellulose acetate and polyamide. The microscopic pores in the membranes allow only water molecules to pass through and not any impurities. So this helps in producing clean drinking water. So this is about the process of reverse osmosis. Now let us see the general advantages of desalination plants. Firstly, it provides a reliable source of drinking water in the areas with limited fresh water resources. Secondly, they can be used to produce clean water for industrial and agricultural uses. Thirdly, they can help to improve public health by providing access to safe drinking water. So this is important in areas where waterborne diseases are very common. Even though it has many advantages, there are still some concerns regarding desalination plants. First is these desalination plants are very expensive to build and operate. Next, desalination plants uses a lot of energy which can contribute to climate change since it is an energy intensive process. The environmental impacts of desalination plants are very huge. See the concentrated salt water which is called the brine water is a byproduct of desalination process. Releasing this brine water from desalination plants into water bodies is dangerous for marine ecosystem. It can change the salinity and oxygen levels of water which can kill marine life. The desalination process itself uses and produces a large number of chemicals like chlorine, carbon dioxide, hydrochloric acid etc. These chemicals can be harmful to environment in high concentrations. So these are some of the concerns regarding desalination plants. Overall desalination is a valuable tool for providing access to drinking water and it helps to achieve the sustainable development goal 6 which is ensuring access to water and sanitation for all so this is all about the discussion now let us move to the next topic look at this editorial article as we all know union government has announced a high level committee on one nation one election this is under the chairmanship of former president ramnath govin the high level committee has met on three occasions to discuss this issue moreover they sought the views of various national and state political parties on this issue So this is the crux of the article given here in our discussion let us understand about one nation one election its advantages and challenges using our usual main answer writing approach now this is the question the idea of one nation one election has potential benefits and challenges associated with it analyze so the keyword is analyze and there is a definite structure in the question we have to list out the benefits of one nation one election and the challenges regarding it So we can divide the body part of the answer into two halves. 
in the first half we can explain about the benefits of this one nation one election and in the second half we can mention the challenges so this question can be asked in gs paper 2 under the syllabus functions and responsibilities of union and states now let us start with the introduction simultaneous election is an idea of holding elections to lok sabha state legislative assemblies at same time that is once in five years the central aim of this idea is to minimize the frequency of elections and reducing the cost of it know that the practice of simultaneous elections is not a new phenomenon in fact it was common until 1967 since then it was disrupted due to various factors like dismissal of elections defections etc moreover a high level committee headed by our former president ramnath govind is appointed to inquire about it now let us see the body part of the answer starting with the benefits of simultaneous election firstly it reduces the massive expenditure in the conduct of elections see as we all know that elections in india is a costly exercise it needs a huge amount of money this cost of election will be substantially lowered with the simultaneous elections moreover the same electoral rolls can be utilized for all elections thereby we can save time and resources for the state secondly the simultaneous elections ensure effective governance in the country Currently, the elections are recurrent in the country at least every three months. This leads to frequent imposition of model code of contact. So it puts hold on the entire development programs and activities of union and state governments. Moreover, under a political pressure to win the elections, the focus of every national leader from prime minister to local panchayat members will be focused on elections, thus neglecting the governance. Also, in the pressure of winning elections, parties often lure voters by considering popular demands without any consideration to public interest. For example, political parties compete in promising individual benefits like social welfare pensions, loan waivers, free housing, food subsidy, free electricity, etc. These practices will be reduced substantially if simultaneous elections were brought in. Thirdly, the issue of prolonged deployment of security personnel will be solved. About 2 to 5 state assemblies go to polls in every 6 month period. This leads to lock-in of central armed police forces and state police forces for prolonged period. The simultaneous elections will lead to effective utilization of human resource of the country. Fourthly, one nation one election will reduce the political polarization. See, frequent elections can increase the political polarization and identity based politics. This can lead to hate crimes across the society. So the simultaneous elections will give no election pressure for five years. This will encourage political parties to focus on broader national and state level issues. Finally, one nation one election will enhance voter participation. The simultaneous elections will encourage high voter participation as citizens have to cast their votes only once in five year period. Moreover, it will be helpful for migrant workers who work at various parts of country to cast their votes and participate in the electoral democracy. So these are the important benefits of one nation, one election idea. Now let us see the challenges associated with the conducting simultaneous elections. Firstly, constitutional challenge. Simultaneous elections require an amendment in various articles of constitution like article 83, 85, 172, 174, etc. Thus, it will need a constitutional amendment with a 50% ratification of states. So, this is going to be a challenge to central government. Secondly, achieving a synchronization with various state assemblies is difficult. Know that the terms of different state governments vary with the term of Lok Sabha. So, to conduct simultaneous election, the center will have to make an agreement with the states to either curtail the terms of their houses or to extend them. So, this curtailment of their term or extension is a major challenge. Thirdly, there will be logistical challenge. See, according to a report by Election Commission, for simultaneous elections in 2024, an additional 11.49 lakh control units and 15 lakh ballot units, 12 lakh VV pad machines will be needed. So, this will be a major logistical challenge for Election Commission. Fourthly, it will have a negative impact for voting pattern of the country. Assume when election is held at national level, the national level issues will overshadow regional aspirations. So finally, it may lead to risk of one party system in the country. See the synchronization of elections might lead to dominant one party system. It means the party winning the national elections may also win the state elections. So this will impact the small parties and state parties. 
so these are the major challenges associated with one nation one election so this is our body part of the answer now moving on to the conclusion see the implementation of simultaneous elections require both legal and social consensus these kinds of moves should be approached with caution and transparency we should not allow gains of efficiency to compromise the essential democratic principles so a gradual well thought approach with the involvement of all stakeholders is essential to successfully implement this idea of one nation one election so this is all regarding this discussion now let us move to the next topic look at this news article it talks about a recent incident where poachers have killed an adult female rhino and stolen its horn the body of the rhino was found in kasiranga national park this incident has raised concerns because it is the first time happening in past one year because last year many conservation efforts were taken to prohibit the poaching practice but the revival of this practice has created concerns regarding the conservation of rhinos so in this context let us quickly go through rhinos in our prelims exam perspective greater one horn rhino is among the five different species of rhino the other four species are sumatran rhino javan rhino black rhino and white rhino among these species only three species of rhino are found in asia that is greater one horn rhino javan rhino and sumatran rhino are found in asia the black rhino and white rhino are found in africa and only the greater one horn rhino is found in india so it is also called indian rhino and it is the largest of rhino species the greater one horn rhino lives in northeastern india southern nepal where they inhabit the grasslands and adjacent woodlands in india rhino is mainly found in assam west bengal and uttar pradesh know that greater one horn rhinos are herbivores they feed on the plants and pasture land The gestation period of rhinos is approximately 15 to 16 months and these rhinos usually enjoy being alone except for females with younger ones. Now talking about their conservation status, the greater one horn rhino is listed as vulnerable in IUCN red list and it is also protected under appendix 1 of CITES convention. In India, the greater one horn rhino is protected under schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Now coming to the threats faced by them. the fragmentation loss of habitat poaching for their horn illegal hunting trading and sometimes floods and human animal conflict are some of the important threats faced by greater one horn rhino after strict protection and management measures the greater one horn rhino was brought back from the extinction however only less than 2000 individuals remain in the wild and mostly they are found in kasiranga national park in assam and chitwan national park in nepal also know that In India rhinos are mainly found in Kasiranga National Park, Pobitora Wildlife Sanctuary, Orang National Park, Manas National Park, all these are in Assam, and Jaldapara National Park, Garumara National Park, these two are in West Bengal, and Dudua Tiger Reserve in Uttar Pradesh. So these are the important protected areas where we can see rhinos. So this is all about the discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Look at this news article. Tamil Nadu government survey shows that 38% of Pallikaranai marshland is under legal and illegal occupation. The occupants include both government departments like railways, elcart and private players. So the article highlights that the Pallikaranai marshland is occupied. So this is the crux of the news article. In our analysis, let us see about the importance of wetland and various steps to conserve it. Firstly, what is wetland? See wetlands are areas of marsh or peatland with the water as major limiting factor. This water can be static or flowing, fresh water or brackish water or even saline water. Know that it also includes an area of marine water where the depth of low tide does not exceed 6 meters. In India there are more than 7 lakh wetlands. This will cover 4.86% of India's geographic area. Now let us understand the importance of wetlands. Firstly, wetlands are major source of water for many people especially in urban areas. They play a double role of preventing droughts and floods. So how this happens? Let me explain it. See, wetlands acts as a sponge and ensures moisture in the soil. It also absorbs excess rainfall and prevents the flood in the city. For example, the areas sheltered by mangroves experienced less damage during the tsunami of 2004. Thus we can say that mangroves will reduce the impact of disasters. Secondly, they act as excellent carbon sink. Various studies shows that peatlands can store twice amount of carbon which is stored by world's forest. Thirdly, wetlands play an important role in coastal economy. 
know that two third of the fish are obtained from coastal wetlands and three fourth of the rice production takes place in wetlands. Thus, wetlands ensure the food security and income security. Fourthly, wetlands are rich in floral and faunal diversity. So it acts as an important site for conserving ecosystem and biodiversity. Now let us see the steps taken to conserve the wetlands. Firstly, National Wetlands Conservation Program. It was implemented since 1985 under the program 115 wetlands have been identified by Ministry of Environment for conservation and management. The criteria for identification of wetlands under this program is similar to Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. Secondly, Wetland Conservation and Management Rules of 2017. It aims to conserve aquatic ecosystems through various conservation plans. Know that these rules have decentralized conservation by delegating to states the power to identify wetlands. Then the recent schemes are Mishti Scheme, Amrit Darohar Scheme, Mangrove Initiative for Shoreline Habitats and Tangible Incomes, which is shortly called as Mishti Scheme. Under this scheme, Mandrega and Kampa funds will be used to achieve two objectives providing gainful employment to the people, increasing the mangrove plantations in the country along the coastlines. Amrit Darogar Scheme is a joint initiative of Ministry of Tourism and Ministry of Environment. It was launched to promote unique conservation values of Ramsar sites and it also aims to generate employment opportunities and supporting local livelihoods around the wetlands. So these are the important conservation measures taken to protect the wetlands. With this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. Take a look at this news article. Following the consecration of Ram Idol in Ayodhya, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced the launch of Pradhan Mantri Suryodaya Yojana. The scheme has aimed to install rooftop solar panels on 1 crore households in India. This is to reduce the electricity bills for the poor and middle class and make the country self-reliant in energy. So this is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us understand the important schemes related to solar energy. Firstly, Government of India has established 19,500 crore Protection Linked Incentive Scheme. This is done on National Program on High Efficiency Solar PV Modules. Secondly, Kishan Urja Suraksha Evam Uttan Maha Abhiyan, which is shortly called as PM Kusum Scheme. The scheme was launched by Ministry of New and Renewable Energy and its purpose is to support installation of off-grid solar pumps in rural areas and to reduce the dependence on grid and in-grid connected areas. So the scheme will be active until 2026. Next is Sustainable Rooftop Implementation for Solar Transfiguration of India which is shortly called as Shristi Scheme. The main aim of the scheme is to generate 40 gigawatt of power from solar rooftops till the financial year 2024. Finally, the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy is implementing new solar power scheme which is for particularly vulnerable tribal groups and this is done under Pradhan Mantri Janjati Adivasi Nyaya Mahabhiyan which is shortly called as Pradhan Mantri Janman Yojana and this is planned for 2023 to 2026. This scheme aims for electrification of 1 lakh unelectrified households in particularly vulnerable tribal areas which is located in 18 states and this is done through off-grid solar power. So these are the important steps taken by Indian government to adopt solar energy and to make the country self-reliant in energy sector. Now we have come to the prelims practice question discussion. Look at the first question, it is about wetlands. If rainforest and tropical forest are the lungs of earth, then surely wetlands function as its kidneys. Which of the following functions of wetlands best reflect the above statement? So this is a previous year question. The correct answer is option D. Aquatic plants absorb heavy metals and excess nutrients. So they function as the kidneys of earth. Now moving on to the second question. Which national park in India is known for having largest population of greater one horned rhinoceros? And it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The answer is option A. Kasiranga National Park. Now look at the third question. The most commonly used technology in desalination plant is the process of reverse osmosis. Yes, this statement is correct. In reverse osmosis, external pressure is applied to push solvents from area of high solute concentration to area of low solute concentration through a membrane. Yes, this statement is also correct. In India, desalination plants have been installed in all coastal areas. This statement is incorrect. So the correct answer is option B, only two. 
So we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video, please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar AIS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.